Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our studies of junior English. We are in the My Perspectives volume on page 178. We're working with Emily Dickinson's classic, I'm Nobody, Who Are You? Now, right away in our notes, let's go ahead and just say it, that Dickinson is going to be playing around with one of the oldest motifs in all of literature. You'll remember it well from our study of Homer's Odyssey. Odysseus, of course, will get off of his boat with his men, go into the cave of Polyphemus, that disgusting Cyclops monster who will eat several of his men, and when that monster asks Odysseus who he is, Odysseus will respond, a nobody. And of course, the stupid Polyphemus Cyclops will call him nobody right up to the moment that he gets blinded, and of course, when his brothers come and shout from outside of his cave, because of course the cave is, is locked uh, down with a large rock, Polyphemus will say, nobody blinded me, nobody blinded me, and all children love that story. Of course, the question of Odysseus's identity, and we've commented on this in complete lectures at LearnStrong.net if you want to run those to crown, is important, right? In other words, all through the poem, as we've said so many times, Odysseus almost seems to never really want to let anybody know who he is, so he'll call himself a nobody, right? But at the end of the poem, when he's trying to actually identify to his son, to his wife, to his father, that he is in fact Odysseus' return, nobody believes him. I think that Dickinson is playing around with all of that motif when she plays this game. Also, as we've commented, the tone. I mean, if you want to learn tone in poetry, obviously Dickinson is the poet to study. It's such a cheeky little tone, and yet I think there's something very subtly going on here as well as she plays the same game that her contemporary Whitman will have played as well in Leaves of Grass, where at times reaches out of the text, we said this in our study, for example, of Whitman's uh, Brooklyn Ferry, reaches out of the text and will actually address you. Notice, I'm nobody. Who are you? I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us. Don't tell. They'd advertise. How dreary to be somebody. How public, like a frog, to tell one's name, the live long June, to an admiring bog. Now, it is interesting that this poem was written uh, in 1861, the year that Lincoln became president, and some people have tried to tie that moment to this poem, which is fascinating. In other words, think about the power of Lincoln himself to go from complete obscurity to the most powerful man in the, certainly in America, some would argue in the world. Notice the way in which the poem will first of all play with exclamation points. So we're making a to-be observation here. Notice the use of the exclamation point. I'm nobody. And again, this takes us with the capitalization especially of nobody. I'm nobody. But then notice that we will have four lines later, the last word of that line is no, as in K-N-O-W. So she's playing around, right, with this idea of no and no, okay? It's, it's fun. Of course, we are speaking here not just epistemologically, but onto ontologically as well. Now, like, who are you? Oh, me? I'm nobody. And then immediately after the exclamation point, who are you? Well, it's obvious. It's like, what do you mean, you? Like, it's, it's fascinating that poems like this never published. It's like, who is she writing to? And again, it's this brilliant, it's, again, back to this, this is my letter to the world, judge tenderly of me, she says, in other words, to the reader, to you, she's speaking directly to you, and she asks you, okay, who are you? Are you, notice the dash, nobody, capital N, dash, to? Now, I find this brilliant, brilliant. It's as if Dickinson, who lived so much of her writer's life in solitude, as we've commented in earlier poems, alone somehow knew all along, you guys would be right here today reading this stuff with her. I find that amazing. And it's like, we're together, she's saying. Oh, oh, we're together. We're both kind of nobodies together. How fascinating is that? So our third line. Then there's a pair of us, exclamation point. Now, of course, think of the power of this. In other words, at the moment that we've recognized each other as nobodies, we are somebodies. Think about the power of that. At the moment, in other words, that you have derived a pal, and that's how I like to think of this poem. In other words, we're pals in this together. Oh, we both recognize each other. In other words, you're always a nobody until you're a somebody. 
And in the moment of the third line, we become somebody's together, a pair. And notice it's exclamation time again, right? Don't tell. Now, it's funny the way she says this, don't tell, meaning um, tell who? Like, like, report to who? Like, in other words, notice there's a third entity. There's Emily, there's you, you now are a pair, don't tell anyone else. In other words, this will be our secret. We're gonna, we're gonna be, we're gonna be nobodies who are somebodies to each other, and nobody else has to know about it. Don't tell. And then why not? Well, all all high school and college readers of this poem understand what the next line means. They'd advertise, you know, with the dash in between for you know exclamation point you know, playing back to the I'm nobody exclamation point. Don't tell. They'd advertise. In other words. Let's just keep this between us, shall we? The brilliance of this poem is that Emily Dickinson reaches out for words, and she taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, who are you anyway? Oh, don't worry, you may be a nobody, but so am I. Which is ironic, because of course, Emily Dickinson is the greatest nobody who maybe ever lived, because she is clearly, in poetic terms, the somebody of all somebodies, right? I mean, there's many of us who would argue, Emily Dickinson is probably the greatest poet in the English language. Certainly, if it isn't Whitman, it's probably Dickinson. And, and, you know, certainly in American letters, for sure. And yet, she says it. I'm, I'm nobody. Don't tell anybody. We don't, we don't want anybody knowing. Then, there's the break. As we've seen so often with the balance of her poems. There's the break. And notice, the last four lines will play the game of what would it be like to be somebody? How dreary, dash, to be, dash. And... We, we have to think, of course, of, uh, of our famous um, Hamlet speech from Hamlet, Shakespeare's Hamlet, Act 3. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing in them. That set of lines we commented at learnstrong.net if you want to run that to ground. But notice how dreary to be somebody. Maybe here she's talking about when others have expectations that they place on you. How difficult is that? Notice somebody here capitalized as opposed to nobody. How public? In other words, everyone knows your business. In other words, do you really want everyone knowing your business? She says, I'm, I'm certain we don't want, as a pair, I'm certain we don't want everybody to know our business. This will just be between us. And then she's, got, she's gonna find a simile. Now, we've commented on her similes, they're brilliant. But how about this one, like a frog? I mean, it's quite remarkable, like a frog? And we think about, of course, all the famous frogs in literature and literary history, like a frog? To tell one's name? The live long June? In other words, she, she comments on people who are constantly self-promoting, 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 being like frogs that sit on a pond all June and do their, you know, their belching sounds. And she goes, oh, how dreary would that be? Notice, to an admiring bog. Oh, now it's brilliant. Of course, the swamp, in other words, right? So she's picturing everybody else as this kind of, you know, collective that in her world, in this moment, they're the nobodies, and the two of us, as a pair, we're the somebodies. Why? Because we're able to see what they can't see, and we're able to understand what they don't understand. And because of that... We are somebody. We're just not nobody. What an amazing little poem. Let's jump to uh, 2A really quickly. Jot down, what are, what's for you? The central message of a poem like this, the most powerful thing you can be is a nobody who is a somebody because of another nobody. What a brilliant insight. All you need is just a couple of pals. All you need is somebody else who recognizes we don't need all of the other. We just need to know each other well enough, and that's enough for us. And that's all that we've got to be. I don't need you as my pal to be a somebody. I just need you to accept me as a nobody that is a somebody. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. At to be, um, I, I, again, I, I, I'm, I'm always blown away by her use of the dash, the capitalization of nobodies and somebodies. The exclamation points and the question uh, marks are brilliant in this as well. At 3A, well, we've mentioned it, and, and it makes you, doesn't it? It makes you want to go back and reread that passage from the Odyssey where Odysseus will play the game of nobody with Polyphemus. Finally, at, at, uh, at, three, at 3B, 
Uh, some of you are smiling because now you understand that I love to say this line as a teacher in a middle of nowhere place that I'm a nobody teaching in a nobody place to somebody's. And now you understand the source of that, of that little saying that I have. To what degree are you a nobody who has a somebody in their life? And to what degree are you a somebody for a nobody? And to what degree are you glad you don't have to be a part of the admiring bog? Don't be a frog. Thank you.